So we talked about two things. One is first order system. And we talk about second order system. So for the first order system, we're talking about one over tau is plus one. So tau is what? Anybody remember what is tau? Time constant. And we say if we want to have a system to be stable, there are two definitions of stable. One is 2%. The other one is 5%. So for the first order system, the required time for 2% is going to be what? 4 tau. And this one is 3 tau, 5% is shorter. And if you want to have 1%, then it's going to be 5 tau. So depending on what kind of a specification you're going to have, you need to use your tau accordingly. Is that a problem? No. For the second order equation, it's going to be more things we need to remember. The first one is damping ratio. We use data to come up with this. Uh, we use the data to represent our damping ratio. So we say that if we want to have a system to be, well, not adequate overshoot, we hope the overshoot to be less or equal to 5%, then the damping ratio required to be 0 0.707. Okay, so 0 0.707 is an important thing you guys need to remember. But this number, uh, it's based on which textbook you're using because if you're using Ogata and Franklin, which is the one you're using right now, this number over here should be 0 0.707. But if you take the uh, exam in the university, which are using other textbooks, the data over here might be changed. It can be 0 0.5, it can be 0 0.6, depending on which textbook you're talking about. Most of the time, it should be 0 0.707. That's my question, but depending on which uh, textbook you're using, this one is going to be changed. The other thing you guys need to uh, remember is omega n. So if you have omega n, it means that is your initial frequency. So if we are talking about those two things, it's the same. If we are talking about 2% error, it's going to be this one. If it's 5%, then it's going to be three over data omega n. Overshoot is defined by 100 something like this, right? So there are a few formulas you might need to remember when you are taking the test. No, don't worry about that, I'll give you the formula. You don't need to memorize everything because I don't believe your memory. I don't, I, I don't believe mine. Okay? So the overshoot is something you need to know. Tempting ratio is something you need to know. Those two I'm not going to give you. Okay? Those two are something you need to remember, okay? So depending on which tempting ratio, uh, depending on which overshoot you're talking about, the tempting ratio is going to be modified accordingly. So those are things you guys need to remember. Uh, and we say that if you are talking about a system, the order is greater than 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, whatever, or 100, you can always couple everything into the combination of first order and second order systems, right? We talk about this a lot of times. So when we are talking about a system, which is a combination of multiple first order and second order systems, we also need to determine one thing, which one is a dominant system. When I'm saying dominant system, what does that mean? Is that the is the dominant system the faster ones or the slower ones? Slower. slower ones. So when we are talking about this one, normally we are talking about about the slowest. Sometimes it's true, sometimes it's not true because if you have two slow systems and they are quite close to each other, that's another story. But in this class, we are not going to talk, we are not going to worry about that because this is just an entry level of course, so we're not going to let you guys worry about that too much. So. Uh, when you know which one is going to be a dominant one, you always need to put 
the pole of the other system five times faster than the solar one. So everything is going to be dominant by the solar one. Does that make sense? So that is something you guys need to remember when I'm saying the dominant one. That the other ones must be five times faster, at least compared to a solar one. That is pretty much what we talk about in uh, chapter four, uh, topic four, right? In topic five, we talk about PID controller. Typically for the control, it is going to be KT plus K, uh, KI over S plus KD as this is D, I, and D. So when we are using this kind of system, uh, this kind of controller, there is one thing important we need to remember, which is when we are talking about the overshoot, the steady state, uh, steady state error, and how fast you're going to achieve to the steady state error. There are a few things you need to know. which we uh, plot everything in S domain. Keep in mind this is an S domain. We're going to talk about L domain, which is similar to this one when we are dealing with frequency response. But this one over here is, we just take everything in terms of S in your um, transfer function and plot your root everywhere. We're going to talk about rule of a stator today, and that is going to be another things we need to worry about. So when we are dealing with this thing, typically we say our Demi ratio required to be, so which yield, this angle is what? Which, how much? 45. 45 degree. That is because if you put 0 0.707 <laughs> over here, this one is going. To, uh, this one is going to be 0.5, and this one is going. To, uh, if you put 0 0.707, this is going to be 0 0.707, and this one over here is going to be 0 0.707. So they're going to be the same, which means it's going to be 45 degree. And if anything lower than this one, the Demi ratio is going to be greater than 0.7, which means your overshoot is going to be less than 5%. If your uh, pole is located in this region, it means that your Demi ratio is too small and the overshoot is going to be greater than 5%. So depending on your specification, again, depending on which textbook you're using, you might have Demi ratio equals 0.5, I think that's nice, and uh, I don't remember the, the overshoot, but I think it's about 18 to 20%, so the, the slope is going to be a little bit different. So you guys need to remember that. If you are taking tests from other university, you guys need to remember which one they're using, okay? In addition to that, you also need to determine where your negative zeta omega n needs to be located because this one is going to be how fast your system is going to approach to steady state error, right? So you draw a straight line over here. Anything on the left hand side is going to be fast enough. Anything on your right hand on the right hand side of this line is too slow. So this region are the places you want to put your poles. So we talk about if we want to have our controller um, to be fast enough and with small enough overshoot, then you can put your poles anywhere you want to. But before we move on to this part, there is one other thing we guys talk, uh, we, we, we talked about earlier, which is if we want to have steady set air, which equals to zero, how the system is going to look like. If you are talking about units that you put. How many integrators do you guys need to have? Or are we need to have for the system? At this one, right? One. So you must have an S in your system. I mean, open loop. So your system is going to be zero, steady state error. If you are having unit rem, The open loop, you need to have two integrators. 
So you are going to have zero steady set error. Normally we are not going to have parabolic input in the system, but if you do, you need to find out corresponding number of integrators existing in your system. Sometimes it's going to be three, sometimes it's going to be four, depending on the order of your parabolic inputs, okay? So those are things you guys need to remember uh, in topic five. Um, anything else? So if we have space by something like this and we requ require the system needs to be zero steady state error, required to be faster than a certain amount of uh, time, and it's the linear, the overshooters needs to be smaller than a certain uh, percentage, then you know where to put your system. Meanwhile, you know whether you require to have uh, integrator in your controller or not. If you do need to have integrator, which type of controller you need to use? P, I, or D? I. I, because this one has integrator, okay? And we also talk about the different properties of KT, KI, and KD. If you have KT, your system is going to be, the response of your system is going to be faster. The steady state error is going to be smaller. However, the overshoot of this guy is going to be, uh, if you are using a P controller only, your overshoot is going to be increased. If you are using integrator, we know for unit step input, it's going to get us zero steady state error. However, the KI over here is also going to increase your overshoot. In order to reduce your overshoot, the only, the only uh, controller we can do is PD. This one over here can reduce, the uh, P over here is going to change the overshoot, but the KD over here is going to uh, decrease the overshoot. So when we are dealing with those kinds of things, you need to know uh, which one you are going to adopt in your system. However, we cannot implement PD controller because it's improper. Okay, which means the order in the numerator is greater than the order in the denominator. Same as EID. This one over here is first order in the denominator, second order in the numerator. So PID is not implementable as well. So when you are designing your controller, you need to think about those kind of things accordingly before you say your system or your controller can be implemented using a microprocessor or something. Because when we are talking about PD controller or PID controller, the order in the numerator is higher than the order in the denominator. It means that you need to have the information from the future. And we know we cannot have any information from the future, even though you can do that in MATLAB or other simulation method, but you cannot do that in real life, okay? So those are the things you guys need to remember when you are dealing with the system design using PID controller. That's pretty much what we talk about in uh, topic five, okay? And topic six, is talking about stability. Stability is straightforward. Draw one. No pose located on right hand side, right? Because if you have any poles in the positive side of the uh, uh, S domain, what happens? It becomes divergent, which means your system becomes unstable. So this is something you, we need to know. However, because our system might be uh, tens order, twenties order, so if we do something like that, it's going to be a little bit difficult for us to identify whether the system is stable or not stable because we cannot get the roots easily. When we have, cannot do that, we use roots per weights. Per, uh, or method. To do to deal with everything. So if we have a polynomial, what we do is 
put a Cartesian over here, n, n minus one, n minus two, n minus three, so on and so on. And solve the Cartesian over here. When we say, when we say it is going to be a stable system, the column over here won't have any change of size, which means if this is positive, this is positive, the rest is going to be, needs to be positive, so the system is going to be stable. If you have one change of sign, what does that mean? We're going to have one hose located on the right hand side, so the system is going to be unstable. If you have negative, that becomes positive. How many uh, holes on the right hand side in the system? Two. If you have more than that, it indicates how many holes you're going to have in the system, in the right hand side. Okay, those are things you guys need to remember. Okay, and uh, this method is handy because if you have a, have a K in your system, which means you have designed your controller and you know the open loop system in your, in your uh, 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 overall system, we can use this method to identify what is the range of K so the system is going to be stable. When you are designing the number of K, keep in mind that K over here is going to be everywhere. It can be show up over here, it can be show up over here, it can be multiple components over here, include K as, a num as part of the number. When you say that uh, you are trying to find the K, the K must fulfill all the numbers over here, which means it's going to be an N. It's going to end everything. Then tell me the range. You cannot say oh, this one or this one or this one, because if you are using the range over here, it might be unstable because it violates the rules on the other components. So when you are designing the K, uh, design your controller, you try to test for the stability using Bruce Hurwitz method, you need to come up with a range of K, and it must fulfill all the, uh, all the criteria all the criteria in this column. Okay, that's pretty much what we talked about in chapter four, five, and six. Any questions? I think it's very little, right? For the test, it's just a little bit amount, right? Should we increase the amount we're going to put in the test, or this is enough for everybody? So today we're going to talk about something new, which is the rule of us. So we talk about S point, S point. We know that if I have my system which is plus one multiplied by k as parts part of a coastal system, we know this one is going to have steady state error because this is just a key controller for the system. But if we increase our k, what happens? The error becomes smaller and smaller, but the overshoot becomes larger and larger. So we want to know how it's going to look like of the coastal pole when we put that on the S domain. So it is clear if the k equals to 1, where are we going to have our pole? Uh, I'm sorry. I shouldn't do that. Uh, it should be a second order system.
Okay, so if if my k equals to one, I'm supposed to have my coastal uh, my open loop pole is going to be here, right? Because this is a two zeta omega n, and this is going to be ten. So when I'm doing something like that, you're going to find out the real part of this pole is going to be 0.7. And since I know it's going to be point, the damping ratio is 0.7, it should, the negative, the, the imaginary part is going to be here, right? So if we put the closed loop system all together, something like this, and our closed loop system is going to be S squared plus 14S, plus a hundred plus a hundred K over blah, blah, blah. I don't care about the part okay over here it's going to be 100 K all right yeah it's going to be something like this okay so as K equals to infinite it's going to be the steady state is going to be one, right? Close to one, never be one, but close to one. Since I have a constant term over here, it can never be one. So the, the zero becomes smaller and smaller. But if you increase the, the um, take a look of this part. This is the coefficient that we're going to determine what is the real part of our system. So the real part or zeta omega n, is this one a constant or not a constant? A constant, right? So it means that my pole is going to be moving along this straight line, <coughs> right? So far, everybody with me understand what I'm talking about? So over here, this part of the equation is going to be my natural frequency, right? So when my natural frequency increased as omega n, uh, as k increased, what happened to this one? What, ha what happened to zeta or the ratio? Smaller. So I know this part over here is going to be along this straight line. So when I say my damping ratio, becomes smaller and smaller, where am I going to move my pole? Upward or, da or downward? Upward. So when K is increasing over here, and we know this one is 0 0.707, as my K increased, I know my damping ratio becomes smaller and smaller. Though it can be infinite, uh, infinite close to a straight line. But since my real part of the roots remains at, along this line, which means it can never get to the imaginary axis, but infinite close. So there's a reason. This one over here is always stable, but the overshoot can be huge okay so when we are talking about this kind of things by changing the k the pole location because this is a close this is open loop pole right and when i'm calculating something like this what am i calculating i'm calculating the open loop uh closed loop poles if my k equals to zero that is my open loop pole If my k start to increase, it doesn't matter how small it is, because if k equals to one, I change my uh, I change my natural frequency, I change my damping ratio as well. So when k increase, the pole start to the closed loop poles is going to start to have a trajectory and it's going to move up. In this specific case, 
uh, application, you're going to see your pole is moving. This one is going to move upward, and this one is going to move downward. This one is something we call root locus. Because the K is changing, it's going to affect where I'm going to place my poles. And uh, if you can find out the trajectory from uh, K equals to zero to K equals, equals to infinite, we can generate a plot. This one is something we call root locus, or the trajectory of my pole. Does it make sense? Everybody understand what I'm talking about? You break my heart. <laughs> <笑>好下課了我們<笑><笑><笑><笑><笑><笑><笑><笑>